Okay, everyone, as you can see, I am in a different place today. I am not in my hallway and I'm trying to get it to live stream to YouTube. So just vision back to the lat to a year ago when we were trying to figure all this out. <laughs> um, I'm in a new space and on a new Wi-Fi. So give me just a second. And we will get started. Okay, it looks like YouTube is getting started. Hopefully it won't echo. Hopefully it will be muted and it won't echo me when we get going. Okay. Well, hello everyone. Um, thank you for your patience with me. Um, and with me all year for that matter. Welcome to the May 2021 Legacies and Lunch, a program of the Central Arkansas Library System's Butler Center for Arkansas Studies. I'm Heather Register Zabinden, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for the Bobby L. Roberts Library of Arkansas History and Art. The Roberts Library houses the galleries and bookstore at Library Square, the Butler Center for Arkansas Studies, and the Encyclopedia of Arkansas. The Roberts Library Research Room is open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 10 until 5. Please go to robertslibrary.org for all the specifics before planning your visit. This program is being live streamed, I hope, to YouTube, and it'll be available to view on the CALS YouTube channel immediately following the program. The speaker will answer questions at the end of the session, so please type your questions in the chat box on Zoom. So for today's program, thank you again for joining us for today's Legacies and Lunch. This month, we are celebrating the EOA's 15th birthday. On May 2nd, 26, 2006, 2006, the Encyclopedia of Arkansas launched with 700 entries and 900 pieces of media, and the world would never be the same. Today, we have over 6,000 entries and over 9,000 pieces of media. To help us commemorate, commemorate this event, we are joined today by Bill Pruden, a longtime author of the, for the Encyclopedia of Arkansas. Bill is the Director of Civic Engagement a college counselor and an instructor in history and social studies at Ravenscroft School in Raleigh, North Carolina. He earned an AB in history from Princeton University and a JD from Case Western Reserve University, as well as master's degrees from Wellesleyan University and Indiana University. He has contributed over 250 entries to the Central Arkansas Library System's Encyclopedia of Arkansas. He has also contributed chapters to books on a number of American history topics, as well as dozens of items in other historical encyclopedias and reference works. So everybody give a warm virtual welcome to Bill Pruden. Let's, there we go. Thank you, Heather. I very much appreciate that introduction. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Um, what I want to do today is give a little bit of background in terms of, as I say, my journey um, in historical writing, beginning with the encyclopedia, as well as sharing some um, of the current research I'm doing that stems out of that. So what all started about a little less than a decade ago. I was randomly surfing the internet, and the next thing I know, I discovered the Encyclopedia of Arkansas. After a lengthy stint in school administration, I was intrigued by what I saw on the website and thought the encyclopedia would be a fun way to get back into the world of history. My tentative inquiry about contributing was well received, and as the cliche goes, the rest was history, is history. Indeed, since that initial inquiry in late 2012, as Heather said, I've written over 250 entries for the encyclopedia, not to mention more than 200 other encyclopedia and reference work entries, most of which had been had come from books that Guy Lancaster, the EOA editor, had directed me to because, as he once said, he has a deep sympathy for the plight of his fellow editors. In addition, I've also been able to contribute some 
chapters of books, a um, couple of which are ongoing, um, all related to Arkansas um, and coming out of my encyclopedia efforts. And, and I am currently working on a book project, the idea of which originated with Guy on Arkansas related Supreme Court cases. All of this, my birth as a writer of history and the resulting intellectual adventures have their roots in an innocent inquiry at what seemed like a very interesting encyclopedia. Little did I know what I'd find. In fact, what I found has proven to be an intellectual playground, a place ideally suited to a person looking to return to the world of historical research and writing. Scanning a list of topics needing authors, I've never failed to find countless items of interest. In the beginning, I often went with safe topics or ones that had a personal tie. Indeed, to the degree I thought I had a specialty in political history, I found lots to pursue in the many men, now a few women, who have represented Arkansas in Congress. Two, when I discovered that the highly respected college president, Nan Kahane, was an Arkansas native indeed in need of an entry, I jumped at the opportunity to do justice to the revered former president and fellow alum of my mother's alma mater, Wellesley College. Similar was the case of renowned sportscaster, football star, and Arkansas native Pat Summerall, who was a one-time golfing buddy of my father. The list of people and events that have caught my attention has been long and I've jumped in, focusing for the most part on politics, the law, and civil rights, with some baseball thrown in. I've explored, investigated, and written, always with an eye to informing and illuminating. For me, it's been a process that has opened up a whole new world of historical inquiry, one I never would have expected from an unlikely student of Arkansas history by any standard. Indeed, born and brought up in Northern New Jersey, just outside New York City, I spent most of my life until my mid thirties north of the Mason-Dixon line. But thanks to the Encyclopedia of Arkansas, I have discovered and developed an appreciation, indeed an affection for Arkansas and its people that I could never have imagined. In writing for the Encyclopedia, I discovered a place that in addition to being ripe with distinctive stories and events of its own, also serves as a microcosm through which to view the nation at large. I've written about local politicians, decades long veterans that were bef that before term limits, about which I also wrote, were the glue that keeps state legislatures running, the ones who stay at home rather than climbing the ladder. There were men and eventually women who've served nobly in a long term, but then there were the others who, intoxicated with power, made decisions that ended their careers in ignominious ways. And there have been athletes, those who laid the foundation for their careers in Arkansas before moving forward, and the others who were local legends and their work here in the state was the peak of their careers. There've been dozens of congressmen, both Arkansas representatives and those born in the state who moved on. And there were trailblazers in human rights in many ways, race, gender, sexual orientation that marked the landscape. His efforts helped mirror and shape the larger national trends in efforts to ratify the ERA, advance civil rights, and in general, move the nation ever closer to its ideal that all men are created equal. <clears throat> in my research efforts, I've found people who have exemplified the best in heroic humanity, like AIDS activist Ruth Coker Burks. And at the same time, I found perpetrators of white nationalist inspired violence, like Richard Wayne Snell. And always intermixed with all of this, there have been media figures I've written about who have helped make sense of it all. And when all of this has sometimes seemed too heavy, I could always turn to baseball and the products of the state who range from Hall of Famers to minor league legends. From these adventures, I've not only learned incalculable amounts, been introduced to unforgettable characters and been afforded great opportunities, but my historical journey has also given me the chance to come to know the Arkansas historical community, a collection of individuals whose talent and dedication are impressive, rivaled only by their generosity of spirit and willingness to take an outsider into their midst, all of it, the intellectual exploration and discovery and the human interaction has had its roots in the encyclopedia. As a high school teacher and a college counselor, I spend much of my time talking with my students about the journey and in thinking about my evolving status as an Arkansas historian, I am amazed and humbled by my own. And it all started with the organization whose 15th birthday we recognize today, the Encyclopedia of Arkansas. There, I have further developed my research and writing skills while playing to my longtime strength of synthesis versus creativity. Indeed, years and years ago, my father, in a very matter of fact and accurate way, referred to me as a jack of all trades and a master of none. Such an intellect is well suited to the shorter, more concise synthesizing that is encyclopedia writing at its best. And it plays well 
with a wide range of curiosity that continually pushes me in new directions while also reminding me of how interrelated all of American history is. Quite simply, it has been a rewarding, gratifying, and endlessly fascinating association. It's also been the foundational experience for a book project I'm now working on, a collection of important Arkansas-related Supreme Court cases. Tentatively titled, Nothing Left to Lose, Arkansas, the U.S. Supreme Court, and the Pursuit of Freedom, the title takes its cue from Chris Christopherson's classic, Me and Bobby McGee, with its bittersweet definition of freedom as, quote, just another word for nothing left to lose. A fitting connection if we remember that with the Supreme Court being the national court of last resort, it has throughout U.S. history frequently been the place where people go when they have no other recourse and nothing left to lose in their pursuit of freedom. In the course of my study, I'm looking at 12 cases, with the first dating back to the 1880s and involving night riding, while the most recent is the 2017 case that added another dimension to the earlier Oberfeld ruling on gay marriage. Each case is rooted in the pursuit of freedom, and as a group, they highlight the different ways the concept is manifested, while also offering a wide range of narratives that make clear both the singular human aspect of the process, both in those who are seeking to achieve freedom in its many forms, as well as those individuals who collectively make it happen or not. Indeed, not all of the cases I'm looking at have happy endings, but each offers a look at an effort to further freedom in the United States. Whether it's Hodges versus the US, an effort to stop night riding, which led to a ruling that in fact eliminated the 13th Amendment as a vehicle for protecting the rights of the 13th Amendment as a vehicle for protecting blacks, or the precedent shattering ruling in Moore versus Dempsey, arguably the only night, the, um, excuse me, the only light of sunshine stemming from the Elaine massacre, where the heroic efforts of Scipio Jones not only saved the lives of a dozen men destined to be executed, but also laid the groundwork for heightened protections for criminal defendants, while also laying the foundation for the NAACP's subsequent campaign for equal rights. And of course, there are the multiple cases stemming from the turmoil that was Little Rock in the latter part of the 1950s each offering a distinctive set of characters, challenges, and issues. Today, I wanna to share a little bit about two of those cases, Epperson versus Arkansas and Mitchell versus United States, each of which offers a distinctive version of the intersection of law, life, and personality that is American constitutional jurisprudence. First, I wanna look at Epperson versus Arkansas. The case that culminated in that Supreme Court decision had its roots almost four decades before in the famous Scopes Monkey Trial, one of the most infamous circus-like proceedings in American legal annals, a small town event that attracted worldwide attention while reflecting the deep cultural divide that marked the 1920s in the United States. While controversy had long surrounded the issue of teaching Darwin's theory of evolution in American schools, the July 1925 Scopes Trial in Dayton, Tennessee featuring former Secretary of State and three-time presidential candidate and Baptist lay leader William Jennings Bryan, aided the aiding the prosecution, and courtroom legend Clarence Darrow, defending the 25-year-old Scopes, took the controversy to a new level. But while it was a perfect symbol of the urban-rural divide of the post-war United States, the case offered little in the way of legal guidance or constitutional jurisprudence, as it all but ignored the broader legal issues like freedom of religion and academic freedom those would come to a head in Epperson. Ironically, despite the popular drumbeat that had followed the trial and led to the 1928 passage of the Arkansas law that prohibited the teaching of, excuse me, <laughs> the teaching of Darwin's theory, it apparently had never been enforced, but it had always been a cloud hanging over the state's educational community. And for many, especially those who sought to upgrade the state's educational reputa reputation, it was a distasteful blemish on, it, on that reputation. So it was that despite fears that doing something about the dormant pr problem would only stir up an unnecessary interest in controversy, Arkansas Educational Association Executive Secretary Forrest Rozelle determined to wipe the relic of another time from the state statute books. But a failed legislative repeal effort only served to put the effort on the public radar where the divide between religion and education that had been so evident in Dayton reappeared in Arkansas. But unlike the Scopes fiasco, the Epperson challenge was a thoughtful, strategic effort to upend a law deemed a direct repute to the First Amendment. 
Indeed, when Rizal and his allies, AEA Council Eugene Warren and State Commissioner of Education Arch Ford decided that a legal challenge represented their best approach, they were determined to avoid a Scopes trial-like circus. Central to achieving that end, keeping the focus on the issue, is finding the right individual to serve as the face of the challenge. Fortunately for Roselle and company, Little Rock Central High School had just such a teacher, a young woman seemingly straight out of Central Casting who fit the role of plaintiff to a T. Susan Smith Epperson had begun teaching at Central High in the fall of 1964. An Arkansas native, she was born in Little Rock and raised as a Presbyterian. In 1919, her father, Dr. T.L. Smith, began a, began, a, began a career teaching science, including biology, at the College of the Ozarks, a Christian college in Clarksville. And Susan attended the local public schools before studying at the college where she had taken classes from her father. After graduating in 1962, having majored in biology, she headed to the University of Illinois, where after two years of study, she earned a master's in zoology. While her professors encouraged her to pursue a doctorate, she had by then met First Lieutenant John O. Epperson, an Air Force pilot she would subsequently marry. And so, after he was stationed in Little Rock, she put aside thoughts of further study and instead sought a job back in the area. Hired by Central High School in the fall of 1964, she joined the faculty as a biology instructor. Now, as both a newlywed and a new teacher, Susan Epperson was certainly not looking for trouble but she was aware of the controversy and realized that the state's adoption of a new biology textbook for use beginning in the fall of 1965, a book whose whole chapter on Darwin's theory represented a direct challenge to the state's almost four years old statute made a conflict unavoidable. Indeed, young Susan Epperson was stuck between the proverbial rock and a hard place. The Arkansas statute was very clear in its prohibition. Even the use of a textbook that included discussion of the theory whether or not the section was assigned, taught, or discussed was banned. And yet Susan's contract in the terms of her employment called on her to quote, teach all branches of biology and accepted theories about how life evolved on earth, thus being no less definitive. Consequently, when Susan was approached by her Central High colleague, Virginia Minor, who represented the AEA, asked if Susan might be interested in being the needed plaintiff, she responded she might be, although she acknowledged later that she really didn't know what they had in mind. Talking to her enthusiastic husband helped ease her qualms. And within a couple of weeks, after meetings with Minor, Eugene Warren, and Forrest Roselle, who ironically had taken classes from her father and knew her parents well, Susan agreed to file the suit, believing that she had responsibilities, both as a teacher of biology and an American citizen to do so. Eugene Warren filed the suit on December 6, 1965, and Susan Epperson immediately informed her principal of what was happening. Harry Carter, like her fellow biology teachers, as well as most of the school community, was totally supportive. At the same time, the young teacher's worst fears were realized when her picture, as well as a short article, appeared on the front page of the next day's Arkansas Gazette. She would soon discover that the story was more than local news. Indeed, Picked up by the Associated Press, the story, and in many cases, Epperson's picture soon appeared from coast to coast in the United States and even as far away as Sydney, Australia, which headlined its story, Monkey Trial, all over again. Not surprisingly, Epperson's students were excited. that Their teacher was a celebrity and a number brought the clipping into class. But she soon learned that not all were as excited as her students and she later acknowledged that she had received some hate mail. Now, while the news reports often refer to the earlier Scopes trial, the wide range of the coverage notwithstanding, the case never took on the circus-like atmosphere that had characterized the earlier version. Some of that was attributable to Everson herself, who helped keep things focused on the issue at hand. Ever the professional, the 24-year-old refused to miss school despite opportunities to appear on a couple of television shows, even though she later admitted it might have been fun. But she realized that such appearances would be distractions which could not only do little to strengthen the case, but might in fact undermine her image as a teacher committed to her teaching, to her students and to science. And she had told one newspaper, she had undertaken the case because she felt quote, an obligation as a responsible teacher to teach the theory of evolution rather than pursuing the quote, sure path to perpetuation of ignorance, prejudice and bigotry. The trial took place in the Chancery Court in Pulaski County with Judge Murray O. Reed presiding. While it began on April 1st, 1966, April's Fool's Day, 
it was clear that Arkansas was not treating it as a joke. In fact, contrary to Warren's expectation, the state would want to settle, the politically ambitious state attorney general Bruce Bennett wanted to be the central figure in a high profile trial. Consequently, Susan Epperson found herself in the unexpected position of testifying in a courtroom overflowing with onlookers questioned by the state attorney general who, unlike Warren and Roselle, seemed intent on awakening the long slumbering ghosts of the Scopes monkey trial. But while admittedly nervous, the young teacher steeled herself for the task at hand, resolving to follow through with what I'd said I'd do, a testimony that lasted less than an hour, she calmly asserted her belief that not only did she have the right to teach the widely accepted theory, but that as a scientist, she had the responsibility to do so. It wasn't an easy effort, but she served her cause nobly. Meanwhile, despite Bennett's best efforts, he reminded no one of Clarence Darrow. In fact, while the initial filing of the suit may have kindled memories of the original Scopes brouhaha, headlines from the first day of testimony made clear that Roselle and company had been successful in avoiding a replay of the Dayton drama. Typical was the headline from the New York Herald Tribune, which declared Arkansas evolution trial lacks 1925 scope drama. In the end, Judge Murray Reed was not convinced by efforts by Bennett's efforts either. On May 27th, he issued his decision, declaring that the law, quote, tends to hinder the quest for knowledge, restrict the freedom to learn, and restrain the freedom to teach, quote, end quote. And thus, the Arkansas statute violated the U.S. Constitution. Not, not surprisingly, Attorney General Bennett quickly appealed the decision to the Arkansas Supreme Court. However, the state Supreme Court did not share his sense of urgency. And it was not for 14 months on June 5th, 1967, that the Supreme Court finally ruled in the case, issuing a cursory per curiam opinion that overruled Reed's ruling. In the years since Reed had issued his ruling, the state's highest court heard no oral arguments and it now offered no formal written opinion. Instead, it issued a two sentence ruling that declared the law a valid exercise of the state's power to specify curriculum in public schools adding that it expresses no opinion on the question of whether the act prohibits any explanation of the theory of evolution or merely prohibits teaching the theory as true. Given all this, it was clear that an appeal would be taken and to the surprise of many, given the odds, it was granted in large part because one man, Justice Abe Fortas, wanted desperately to hear it. Tennessee born Fortas had been a 15 year old living in Memphis in 1925 and knew the original case well. Brushing aside the objections of his clerk, Fortas, Fortas seized upon the opportunity Epperson presented to address the constitutional issues that had been lost amid the Dayton circus and convinced the court to seek more information from the state. The state was now being represented by Attorney General Joseph Purcell who had beaten Bruce Bennett in the Democratic primary. And while he had no vested interest, he responded but the perfunctory response simply offered that the statute was a legitimate exercise of the state's power. Fortas, a working class Jew, remembered vividly what it was like to live in the midst of fundamentalist country. And as if on a crusade, he went to work convincing his brethren who ultimately agreed to hear the case, although not without recognizing the potential for another circus. When the case was argued on October 6th, 1968, just a month before the presidential election, Susan Epperson was in attendance. She had left Little Rock not long after the original trial when her husband John was given an assignment in Missouri, but he was now working at the Pentagon and the couple and their first child were living in Northern Virginia. So it was easy for the two of them to come sit in the majestic, highly sealed courtroom as the court led by Chief Justice Earl Warren and followed by Associate Justices Hugo Black, William Douglas, John Marshall Harlan II, William Brennan, Potter Stewart, Byron White, Fortas and Thurgood Marshall took their seats. The presentations by the attorneys were straightforward as was the issue before the court. Whether the Arkansas statute prohibiting the teaching of evolution was a violation of the teacher's free speech right or whether it was a violation of the establishment clause of the first amendment. Eugene Warren again made the case for Epperson while being opposed this time by the assistant Arkansas attorney general, Don Langston who happened to be an old acquaintance of Susan's from college. Langston's business-like approach represented a stark contrast with the state attorney general Bennett's original trial effort. Once oral arguments were completed, Fortas found himself confronted by a group of skeptical colleagues who clearly did not share 
his desire to use Epperson as a vehicle for definitive constitutional interpretation. In fact, for the most part, his colleagues were dismissive of the whole enterprise, deeply disturbed with the way the Arkansas Supreme Court had handled it. In Supreme Court, a senior associate justice, Hugo Black, who was particularly unable to mask his contempt for the whole proceeding, concluding this case is too minor for us to deal with. Others were no more enthusiastic, but into the void stepped a determined Fortis. Wading in on the substantive issue of religion, he told his fellow conferees, I would reverse on what to me is the narrowest ground, the establishment of religion. I don't have trouble getting to that issue. With the door open, he suddenly found himself having allies as Justices Stewart, Harlan, and Marshall added their support. Given that evolution, Ford has now lobbied hard to be assigned the opinion and then the opportunity to address a lingering state stain on his home state's reputation. Recognizing the meeting of the man in the moment, Chief Justice Warren gave Fortas his chance, assigning him the opinion. It was an opportunity that Fortas had coveted since the appeal had first arrived at the court, and he went to work to draft a decision that he hoped would bring an issue, one embedded in the nation's collective consciousness in the form of the now decades old monkey trial to a constitutionally based close. Intent on securing a majority behind his view of the case as one based on a violation of the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, he wrote an opinion that was definitive in that conclusion, leaving no doubt that the Arkansas statute was not about education, but was about imposing a particular religious view on all students in the class. And in that way, it reflected an effort to establish a government-sponsored religious program, or at least directive, and thus violated the constitutional First Amendment prohibition on laws concerning the establishment of the religion. Fortas's opinion made clear the court's determination that the Arkansas law, one which Fortas made clear had its roots in the Scopes trial, did not reflect the requirement of religious neutrality. The justices acknowledged that a state had the right to prescribe the curriculum for its public school, but made clear that right did not include the authority to prohibit the teaching of a theory or doctrine for reasons that violated the First Amendment. From the outset, the Tennessee native made clear where the roots of the case lay. But while it may have made the case of greater interest to the general public, the express tie to Dayton and Scopes had no impact on the ruling. But while Fortas was unable to bring his brethren around to his, to his point of view, the court unanimously struck down the law, but only seven justices saw the violation of the Establishment Clause, Black being the my final holdout. The Epperson ruling and Fortas's opinion represented a distinguished, a distinctive landmark legal ruling. It was one of the crowning accomplishments of Fortas's long and distinguished legal career, a career capped by his tenure on the court. At the same time, in a twist of fate that no one could have imagined at the time, it also proved to be his last major opinion. Meanwhile, Susan Epperson admitted to being excited upon hearing about the court's decision. Ironically, but befitting the way the court operates, despite being a named party in the historic case, she only, she would later recall that she only found out about the ruling when a reporter from Time Magazine called seeking an interview about her reaction to the case. So much for making history. Now, in contrast, we have the case of Mitchell versus United States, a 1941 decision that validated one man's very personal crusade against the indignities that were Jim Crow. Illinois Congressman Arthur Mitchell was guaranteed at least a footnote in the history books when in 1934, upsetting incumbent Republican Congressman Oscar DePriest, Mitchell became the first African-American Democrat ever elected to Congress. And until his vacation trek to Hot Springs, Arkansas was unceremoniously interrupted when he was forced to give up his seat in first class and instead moved to the segregated black section of the train as mandated by the Arkansas separate coach law of 1891 centerpiece of the state's Jim Crow system, Mitchell had seen more than satisfied to have that be his historical lot. But all of that changed on April 21st, 1937, when the extremely proud Mitchell, his dignity diminished by his treatment at the hands of the conductor, Albert Jones, determined to pursue a challenge to the law and an appropriate response to the indignity he had suffered. Indeed, when Jones brusquely informed Mitchell that under Arkansas law, he had to move, it became personal. And while Mitchell grudgingly complied, he determined that he would take action. And so he did. Upon returning to the Windy City, 
Mitchell consulted with a fellow attorney, Ralph Westbrook, and after some study and deliberation, the pair decided to file suit. And asserting that they were filed both in state court and with these inter the, the Interstate Commerce Commission, asserting that the accommodations provided black passengers were not only not equal, but that regardless, that standard was not one to be enforced by the ICC. Up until this time, the life of Arthur Wergs Mitchell seemed like a page out of the American dream annals. Born on December 22nd, 1883, on a farm in Lafayette, Alabama, the parents born into slavery, he turned a brief stint at Tuskegee Institute and a similarly brief association with its iconic founder, Booker T. Washington, into a career in education, saw the smooth talking Mitchell ultimately develop and head a number of schools modeled on Washington's efforts. While his relocation to Washington, DC in 1919 under something of a cloud seemed more typical of a con man than an educator, Mitchell used well-established contacts to secure a government job in the nation's capital while also pursuing a legal education. Correspondence course supplemented by private study quickly enabled him to gain admittance to the DC bar in 1927. He also began to get involved in politics and secured a job with the 1928 Hoover presidential campaign. Given the task of shadowing and rebutting Democratic spokesmen in the Chicago area, Mitchell shined. He also quickly realized that his own ambitions might be better served within the Democratic Party. In the aftermath of the 1928 election, Mitchell returned to Washington and prepared to relocate. By the end of 1929, he was settled in Chicago where he set up a law practice and got involved in the local real estate market. Then, seeking an entree into democratic politics, Mitchell turned to a former Alabama associate, Congressman John McDuffie, who connected him with FDR campaign chief, Jim Farley. Farley assigned Mitchell to shadow Chicago's black Republican Congressman, Oscar DePriest, who was undertaking a speaking tour of California on behalf of President Hoover. It was a perfect situation for Mitchell and he more than held his own giving the Chicago Democratic machine every reason to make him the man to take on DePriest in 1934. However, Mitchell quickly learned that regardless of the party in politics, one still has to pay their dues and lacking the backing of the leadership, he lost the 1934 Democratic primary to Harry Baker, a longtime party member who had lost to DePriest previously in 1932. However, seemingly leading a charmed life, Mitchell was named the Democratic nominee after Baker died of a sudden heart attack. In a hard fought race by astutely tying DePriest to the Republicans in the Great Depression, Mitchell came away with a 53-47% win that made him the first African-American Democrat ever elected to Congress. With his clear focus on his own interests and ambitions as opposed to an issue-driven agenda, it was clear that he would do the mach party machine's bidding and in return, they would back him for future reelection. It was an arrangement with which he was comfortable and with which he accepted from the outset. He indicated no desire or intention to be a representative of his race or to pursue a civil rights focused agenda. Rather, he was determined to do and did the Chicago machine's bidding. Such was the backdrop to Mitchell's ill-fated trip to Hot Springs and his subsequent highly personal legal challenge. Now, Mitchell and Westbrooks quickly realized they were entering uncharted territory after um, instituting their suits. Since the historic 1896 ruling in Plessy versus Ferguson, the Supreme Court had done little about guaranteeing the equality of the facilities in question. Indeed, in the almost 50 years the, of the six alleged discrimination in transportation cases the court had heard, only McCabe versus Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe in 1914 had any real bearing on Mitchell's complaint. But McCabe did make clear that when it came to comforts and facilities, one race could not be denied that which the other race received. With McCabe case in hand, Mitchell and Westbrooks believed they had grounds upon which to base their claim. In addition, their review of the Arkansas statute only reinforced their belief in the correctness of their approach. For while the state statute was unequivocal in its declaration that racial segregation had to be maintained on the train, thus the need to move Mitchell um, to the black section, it was no less clear that equality of offerings were no less question, no less in doubt. Consequently, on May 10th, 1937, Mitchell filed a personal injury lawsuit seeking $50,000 in damages against Rock Island, Illinois Central, and Pullman companies in the Federal Circuit Court in Chicago, since that's where the original ticket had been bought. 
In addition, in an accompanying action, he sought and was granted a hearing before an ICC commissioner. The response to his suit in the black press was overwhelming and overwhelmingly positive. Featured on the front pages of numerous papers, the horrors of what he had endured were detailed and he was hailed as a hero for his willingness to stand up for himself and his people. Numerous papers which had previously castigated him for his unwillingness to be a representative of the African-American community now offered support and praise. It was a stunning turnaround, one which Mitchell clearly found gratifying. And yet, as gratifying as the initial reaction was, Mitchell and Westbrooks knew they were facing a serious challenge. It was soon apparent that Mitchell had hit a nerve as not only did Rock Island assign two lawyers to the case, but in August, without explanation, Rock Island's Hot Springs to Memphis run saw the railroad replacing all of its old tattered cars with modern streamlined ones, which included running water, air conditioning, and flush toilets and comfortable seats. Meanwhile, the complaint submitted to the ICC represented a precedent setting collection of issues. Foremost among them was seeking resolution of that were seeking resolution was whether it was legal for blacks to be forced into coach when they had a first class Pullman ticket. Mitchell also wanted to know whether the railroads had to provide a standard level of service unrelated to the race of the passengers. In both his testimony before the ICC and in his civil suit, Mitchell recounted the indignities he suffered as he sat among the filth and despair that characterized the black car. As he later recounted the experience, it was clear that as he sat there, brooding about the way he, a duly elected member of the United States Congress had been treated, his determination to address the situation had only increased. The civil suit was quickly put on a back burner as all parties focused their attention on the ICC proceedings. But for Mitchell, the experience before the ICC was nothing but frustrating as the hearing was delayed until March 7, 1938. In the midst of all this, however, Mitchell and Westbrooks were able to um, bring themselves up to speed legally while also fielding numerous offers of help. And yet the flinty congressman was determined to keep control of his effort. It was Mitchell's suit and it was his own graphic description of the separate cars that was at the heart of the argument. Indeed, central to both his suit and the complaint was the disgusting conditions of the facilities to which Mitchell was consigned. Observing that, quote, the car was divided by partitions and partly used for carrying luggage, poorly ventilated, filthy, filled with stench and odors emitting from the toilet and other filth, which is indescribable, unquote. He was no less gentle in recounting the treatment he had received at the hands of Conductor Jones, describing his language toward a member of Congress as, quote, too opprobrious and profane, vulgar and filthy, he spread upon the records of this court. He also noted that the colored cars were not air conditioned and were divided part partitions into three sections, one for colored smokers, one for white smokers, and one in the center for colored men and women. One toilet was shared by all three. In contrast, he noted that the cars for the white passengers were in excellent condition, modern and well-maintained. Air conditioned, having hot and cold running water and supplied with towels, soap, and flushable toilets for both men and women. In addition, he noted that the first-class passengers were the sole ones able to use the dining car and observation parlor car. Over the course of the litigation, it became an oft-told tale offered in the context of the existing separate but equal doctrine established by the court in 1896 in Plessy versus Ferguson. And while some civil rights advocates criticized Mitchell for not, recount, for not attacking the doctrine, after hearing Mitchell's recounting of his experience, there could be no denying that there was nothing equal about the black and white accommodations on Rock Hill's trains. In fact, the representative of the railroads did not even dispute the evident inequality. But all of that seemed to be ignore, ignored by ICC examiner William Disk, who on May 4th, 1938, proposed the dismissal of Mitchell's complaint. Barely acknowledging the disparities of the accommodations, he instead asserted that there was not enough demand by blacks for the first class travel to justify the addition of extra equal cars. Finances took for Disk not only trumped humanity, but also apparently legal precedent. Outraged at the decision, Mitchell filed an appeal, seeking a hearing before the commission itself. He got it, and Mitchell again retold his by now familiar tale of woe, concluding with what he saw as the basic question, whether a colored man who buys a first-class ticket traveling interstate because he happens to enter a state where there is segregation, can the conductor and can the state of the laws of that state rob this man of the right 
which he has acquired under the Constitution. By a 65 vote, the all-white commission concluded that yes, it could, again making a determination based exclusively in the economic aspects of the controversy. To no one's surprise, Mitchell refused to abandon the cause, instead appealing to the commission's ruling to the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Illinois. But it too dismissed the complaint, observing that small number of colored passengers asking for first-class accommodations justified an occasional discrimination against them because of their race. With each rebuff only strengthening Mitchell's resolve, he quickly appealed the case to the U.S. Supreme Court, where he hoped to become the first black ever to argue his own case before the high court. The court gave him that opportunity, but it also upped the political stakes, for the court's willingness to hear the case presented the Roosevelt administration with a dilemma of its own. With the United States being a co-defendant due to the connection to the ICC, the Justice Department needed, at the very least, to offer a government memorandum. The result would be a political da politically dangerous situation. Supporting Mitchell could alienate the Southern forces in Congress, whose opposition to his challenge could sidetrack the ongoing efforts and opposition to the challenge could sidetrack ongoing efforts to move the black vote into the Democratic camp. In the end, Attorney General Robert Jackson directed Solicitor General Francis Biddle to file a memorandum that called on the court to reverse the lower court ruling. Southern political leaders were not pleased. And the state attorney generals of Alabama and Arkansas organized a group that filed an amicus curiae brief in support of the railroad. Finally, on March 13, 1941, Arthur Mitchell argued his case before a Supreme Court headed by the soon to retire Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes and a, featuring a number of justices newly appointed by Franklin Roosevelt. Mitchell again detailed the indignities he had suffered and that were the lot of all black passengers, while also making clear that he was not attacking segregation, but was simply asking the railroad to make good on his first amendment, on, excuse me, on his first class ticket. Conversely, the railroads again, or offered their supply and demand based economic arguments. And when Chief Justice Hughes suggested that integration might be a way to address the low demand, the attorneys expressed their fear that the dining car would be empty. Despite competing economic arguments to the surprise of most analysts, the court did not treat the case as a matter of contract law. Instead, the eight justices focused on civil rights. And in an opinion by Chief Justice Hughes, the court declared that Mitchell's rights were guaranteed by the constitution and the number of passengers on the train was not an excuse to abridge those rights. Indeed, the case allowed the Chief Justice to expand upon his initial opinion in McCabe. Writing in 1914 for a five to four majority, he had declared unconstitutional the part of an Oklahoma statute that permitted railroads to provide luxury cars for whites while offering none for non-whites. While he accepted Plessy's separate but equal doctrine, Hughes made clear that even if only a single non-white required a luxury car, the railroad had to provide it regardless of the cost, declaring that, quote, constitutional right does not depend upon the number of persons who may be discriminated against. The essence of the constitutional right is that it is a personal one. With the plaintiffs in McCabe lacking standing, Hughes's noble declaration about the essence of the constitutional right offered little more than a promise of perhaps better things to come, while also planting a seed for future action. Now, 25 years later, Mitchell's suit represented a chance to expand upon and affirm that personal right, providing the 79-year-old jurist with an opportunity to complete some unfinished business while nudging the ball a little further down the road. In a majority opinion, Hughes overturned the ICC and lower court rulings while clearly calling upon the railroad to uphold the equal part of the formula and not simply at their convenience. It was a singular triumph for Mitchell, if an ironic one, given his previous record and the lack of any real publicly express commitment to civil rights. But the vehemence with which he undertook the effort, not to mention his personal involvement, sent an unequivocal but clear message. This was personal. He, Arthur Mitchell, would not allow himself to be treated that way. And if in the effort to address that personal indignity, the rest of the nation's black population was served, all the better. Ironically, as much as gratifying as the response of the case was, it was also something of a consolation prize for Mitchell. For in the changing political landscape, Arthur Mitchell suddenly found himself the odd man out in an inter-party battle, and he was denied renomination in 1942. But in fact, it was a setback that left him only more proud of his court triumph, a final accomplishment that flew in the face of much of his earlier work, while also running counter to his reputation 
as a man unwilling to serve the African-American population. It was an historic achievement and it was all his. Thank you. Now, I know we have some questions. I don't know, uh, Heather, you're gonna tell me what they are? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. Okay, well, first of all, Guy Lancaster um, has said that that it is it today just happens to be the day that John T. Scopes was arrested for teaching the teaching oh. of evolutionary theory in 1925. So we didn't plan that. <laughs> that worked perfectly. <laughs> it did. I love when those coincidences happen. Um, and then Audrey Evans, who is one of our board members, made the comment, Moore versus Dempsey, Scipio Africanus Jones, everyone should know his name. And that's, that Most is definitely, definitely the truth. Um, so Cody Berry asks, and this is actually, Cody read my mind, because at the same time he was typing in this question, I was writing it down on a post-it note. What is your favorite entry of the entries that you've written? Oh, that's hard. <laughs> that's real hard. Um, I think I've developed a particular hot, um, soft spot for what ironically was my first, and that was a Hodges versus US. Um, and in part because it's expanded into one of the uh, chapters in, in what I hope will be a book. Um, and sort of, it's, Kind of vindicate it's like it's the subtitle of the chapter is unintended consequences um, because the local U.S. attorney went after night riding in hopes of putting an end to it and instead gave a Plessy versus Ferguson oriented Supreme Court um, an opportunity to basically emasculate the Thirteenth Amendment and render it worthless as a protection other than pure slavery. Um, for African Americans until the Warren Court finally overrules it in 1968. Um, but it's, I mean, the, the 250 has there's been just a real tremendous range. As I mentioned, um, I was really, really didn't know anything about it and was really touched with the uh, tremendous humanity of, of Ruth um, Coker Burks. Um, I've seen, as say, the, the depraved side. Um, I've been amazed at the breadth of politics in, in Arkansas. I've written about um, the Socialist Party candidates and the party development, the Communist Party candidate um, on the various times. So um, it's, there's, it's hard. It's hard to say. Yeah. It's like picking your favorite kid, right? That's right. Exactly. Uh, okay. So Cody also asks, what was the hardest one to write? Oh, that's hard too. I mean, it, it's, you know, some of them you have to you know, again, the synthesis aspect of encyclopedia, you gotta find ways to kind of craft it. And others, when you get the core of it, you realize how important they are and trying to find the support to deal with it is is hard. So, I mean, I have, a, you know, and, and also there's there's the other ones. I mean, I did a couple that are related to um, the Clinton administration. Um, and, you know, it, it's interesting. You get sort of, there's the, the, public perception of things and then you dig a little bit deeper and there's more to it than that and um, you know and which again I think is part of, of, of history I mean I know I, I was staying with a friend of mine the other day we were talking about a particular book um, the books that I find most fascinating are the ones I obviously am learning something from but also the ones that something jumps out and I, I find myself running to the footnotes to find out where the heck did they get that because it yeah. is just such a kind of bizarre little thing that adds so much to the story so I mean I think you know to me that's what you're always trying to educate and illuminate um, and, and get a better sense. And as a writer and a reader, those are the things I look for. Well, one of the things I was thinking as I was listening was, um, you know, doing the research, like, you know, finding all of the details. I mean, that's one of the great things that I love about doing history is all the pieces. And, and I talk a lot about the rabbit hole, you know, you'll go down a rabbit hole and you find a bunch of new stuff. You may not find what you're looking for, but you'll find a bunch. So what kind of resource, you know, where are you looking when you're writing some of these? I mean, for instance, the the two articles that you tar, the two entries that you discussed, I mean, where are you getting your information? Um, those are a combination. I've been lucky there. I mean, there's some secondary sources. Um, there is um, in part, I think, because of his status as the um, first, Democrat elected to Congress, there is a biography of um, Arthur Mitchell, um, ironically written by a, um, a non-American. 
um, which isn't necessarily what you expect. Um, but there's also, you know, it, I think depending upon the exact timing, um, ideally there's newspaper um, work. Some of the court cases, um, obviously there, the legal records are there. I mean, an awful lot of cases of a Supreme Court case, you almost kind of start with a Supreme Court decision and see kind of how they, and then go back mm -hmm. on that. Um, because of the different directions that they go on, um, the Epperson case um, had, because I think in part because everybody associates it with scopes. If you look at all, it starts there. And as a result, it did get more attention than, than most, even if they aren't really related. And it is interesting. I mean, one of the things that just jumped out at me in the course of the research was how absolutely determined the Arkansas authorities were and Susan Epperson as a person very much helped that to avoid scopes too. Um, they realized that there had been nothing positive in terms of the kind of things they wanted out of the, the drama. Um, and, you know, she actually, I, in one of the sources I found, she said that looking back on it, it was not something she saw, but the other time, at the time, at that point, she's, you know, a young newlywed trying to find a job in the area that her husband's just been sent to. But she wondered if her hiring hadn't been based in part with an eye to, we're going to want to challenge this. And this is a, I mean, she was just a perfect, mm -hmm. you know, candidate. I mean, the, the religious background, the local, you know, you, Anybody who's ever studied the, you know, any kind of civil rights in particular in the South at that period, the absolute worst thing you could be is an outside agitator. So, you know, and an Arkansas born, gone to a Bible, you know, Christian college, all of that, yeah. you couldn't find anybody better to um, as a as a plaintiff in that case. So Guy has another question and it's it's long, which I always tease him. He writes these really long questions. I think it's a test to see if I can read it correctly. Um, it seems that our understanding of the role of the courts has shifted in recent decades. Now it seems state legislators pass laws in order to get them into the courts to try to change national precedent. Is this a result of incipient polarization that we are seeing these days, a breakdown in our belief in genuine democracy or what? Question mark. Um, I realize that this might be a little off topic, but your discussion of Epperson brought to mind the Arkansas House passed a bill allowing creationism specifically because of the belief that its sponsor, of its sponsor, that the current makeup of the Supreme Court would result in overthrowing of precedent. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's all that, but I think it's kind of, you know, I've talked about whether because we're divided demographic, dem as far as democracy goes, I think it works both ways. Um, if you go back in the, and the, the, you know, Hodges versus US was an example of that, um, the court that that court case went to when they thought they could get a ruling that would help empower the federal government to put things like night riding out of business, um, instead they get it to go the other way. In the 40s and 50s, you start to get, as the Supreme Court changes, beginning really with FDR appointees, you start to get a court that is going to help move things forward when Congress was not, when the representative bodies weren't. I mean, you still had, and, and Guy knows this because I wrote about it um, in terms of, in his Annie Lynching book when I was talking, you know, it's hard to know exactly where FDR was because he was such a closed mouth politician, but Eleanor was clearly, I mean, he was, I think he was far more of a civil rights advocate than his record shows because he had no choice with a totally dominated Southern Congress. So, you know, had he come out against the, or for an anti-lynching law, they never would have gotten anywhere. And instead he loses potentially social security and the WPA and all of those kind of things. So you have to hold it. Congress wasn't changing. You still hit the fifties. You still have, you know, you have a Texas majority leader and what have you. So, but at the same time, when you get a Supreme court or you get an Earl Warren, who turns out to be a surprise uh, when you get William Brennan on top of the Blacks and the Douglases and what have you, and suddenly the courts become the place to go. And the NAACP under Thurgood Marshall had made that very clear as they had chipped away point by point. Now we're at a different point where, um, you know, and I've, I've read legal, liberal legal strategists saying, you know, we're, we don't want to go to the court because they don't want, again, the big issue with the court is you get that precedent. It's one thing to pass a law that you can hopefully get overridden, but, you know, part of the reason why, um, 
you know, advocates of, of abortion one direction or the other talk about a constitutional amendment that doesn't lead itself to be open to the vagaries of the of changing court membership. Yeah. yeah. So Mark Chris would like to know, can you name your favorite hero and favorite villain that you've encountered in your EOA journey? Uh, favorite hero and my favorite villain. Uh, um, I, from a humanitarian perspective, Ruth Cope really, really affected, um, really affected me. And I actually was looking up something the other day and realized, and I, they'd been talking about it when I wrote the thing. She's written a book, which I've ordered, and it should come in the next day or two, um, which I'm looking forward to down. seeing. Um, but I, um, so I was really impressed with that on a, on a humane level. There was just um, one of the things that impressed me, and some of it is I think they don't get the attention and it's no single one. Um, and I kind of alluded to it in my introductory remarks. Um, the number of really, to me, dedicated public servants who serve in the state legislature. I mean, I think in general, and I think it's something of a crime and, it, and I think it, it hurts our governmental system. State legislators don't get the attention and that's a good and bad, you know, as a result of, <laughs> They pass a lot of things that we're not aware of until it's too late. Um, you know, I think some of the recent debates over, you know, voter suppression, voter IDs, those kind of things. North Carolina is in the middle of, of a lot of that. Um, but at the same time, there are an awful lot of people who have, you know, put a lot of time in, and I ended up writing about a lot of them. And I find, in some respects, I find them compelling. I, I think I said the guy at one point. Um, I learned in the course of of a lot of my work with the encyclopedia, um, not that I didn't know it having um, been in a uh, legislative assistant at one point on the Hill, but there are a lot of people who, you know, kind of go through life and it's on their resume and undoubtedly the obituary Congressman X, but you kind of wonder what they did other than occupy space. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's hard. You, you got to work, you got to develop seniority, but, um, but I think, you know, a lot of those people and, and I've written about a number of them um, put in a lot of time before the term limits came and really, I think, you know, we're trying to address problems in Arkansas in ways that were aimed at serving their people without looking at it as a, you know, where's my next best press release gonna come and how's this gonna help me in my next run for whatever the next office is. Yeah, I think, I think you're right about that. Um, I, I wish there were more right now though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's funny, it's one of those, uh, you know, double-edged swords of term limits too, which I said I did, I wrote about that too. I mean, I'm, I'm old fashioned enough, although there are times it's like, get that person out of here where I think, you know, realistically, re you know, every election is a form of a term limit. You can vote those people out, but um, yeah. at the same time, it's, you know, it, it's, it points out some of the challenges of a democratic process, which is that ultimately people have to be engaged enough to know what people are doing in there as opposed to, oh, that's the name I recognize, so I'll vote for him mm -hmm. again. So as an educator, you know, teaching students, I mean, you, you teach or you're at a school, a day, you know, an independent day school. I think mm -hmm. I did look it up on the website. Um, yeah. I mean, talk about how resources like the EOA help students um, of all, you know, of all ages, you know, this, how do you feel about that? I think, you know, I'm a great believer in, in I mean, I'm a great believer in the critical nature of an informed electorate. Um, and, you know, the knowledge is there. I teach a government class and I'm, you know, far less concerned about the details I've, I've moved away from. I used to give a very difficult constitution test with all the little details. And I mean, realistically, unless they're gonna be a constitutional scholar, it doesn't matter, but I want them to have the concepts. I want them to understand the issues. And I want them to ultimately come out with a sense of what their role is within the democratic process and, 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 and hopefully be encouraged to know that they have a role, um, you know, even if it's only a, a voter, but to do that in a responsible way. So, um, you know, we're using things, trying to give, you know, context um, and, and have them understand the importance of, of all of that. And I, I try to give assignments that have them doing research and again that kind of rabbit hole you know in an ideal world somebody learns something and they'll just keep running with it um, 
but I, you know, I, I think the encyclopedia is great. I mean, in addition, I mean, it's been obviously I've thoroughly enjoyed it, but it to me there's a tremendous amount of really, really good information that that helps people understand Arkansas. It certainly has with me, as I and, and again, it's one of those you know I do one and I'm, I'll go back to the, you know I go back to it for for research um my stuff beyond what I've written. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a um, it's a great resource that that people use, and um, you know we're 15 years old, but it kind of sort of feels like I don't remember not having it. Um, and you know, <laughs> I've thought every once in a while, like, what did we do before? I mean, we went to we went to the library, we looked in the books, um, you know. But but it is a great resource. Well, thank you so much for doing oh. this. Thank you so much for um, helping us celebrate our 15th birthday. Well, um, I'm, a, I'm a big, it's been great for me, but I'm just, I'm just a fan. I really, I would love to see, you know, more of places have them just to serve their their areas and their states. But if they were, if they're looking for how to do it, um, they have a model. Well, thank you so much, Bill. I really appreciate it. And um, I want to tell everybody that YouTube didn't work. I'm not sure what happened. This has happened one other time in the past year. So um, this will be available in probably a couple of hours. It'll have to upload. Um, we weren't able to live stream. But join us next month to see Kathleen Condre discuss her new book, Das American Echo. Um, that will be on June 2nd at noon and we will be virtual again and hopefully YouTube will work. So thank you very much again, Bill. I really appreciate it. And everybody have a good day. Thank you.